Wow, so I was not expecting that kind of explosion from my last video. Trying not to be overwhelmed. But I guess I am a little bit, which is why it's been a while since I've made my last video. But I think I had the perfect solution. Instead of making a video on one of my silly mods, I'm going to look at somebody else's awesome mod. Now what I'm about to show you is one of my favorite mods of all time. Now there's a lot of reasons for this, but I think the number one reason why it's my favorite mod is that its creator, James, documented the entire process and did so in a way that was easily accessible for new modders and modders in particular who are looking to step up their game into design for manufacture. I really wish that James had made this about mm, 10 years ago. That would have been really helpful. But if you're just starting to get into fabrication or you're wondering what it takes to get a computer case made from scratch from the beginning, his thread in the smallformfactor.net forum is incredible. So go check it out. So what's his mod all about? Well, James has created the world's most powerful power supply. When I say world's most powerful power supply, I mean 3D Mark score, not wattage output. This is the STX160. This is a fully functional computer system with a GeForce 1060 graphics card inside of it. And it's wrapped inside a custom ATX power supply case. Now, even though I'm holding this in my hand, I know it can be kind of hard to get a sense of scale. So here it is next to a picture of small form factor soda. <laughs> Coke Zero. And uh, here's a picture next to a mini ITX motherboard, which absolutely dwarfs it. You know, you talk about the ultimate sleeper computer. Imagine putting this inside of a full tower, but nothing else. So this is a unique mod because it's not handmade, nor is it made with the intent of being a one-off. It is intent to being a one-off. James isn't really gonna be making any more of these, but it's designed as if it were to be mass produced. So this actually makes it pretty unique looking because the folds, the bins, the press and in inserts for the standoffs, everything is designed and of the level of quality as you would expect to see from a large manufacturer. Now, of course that's interesting, but what's phenomenally interesting is that James walks us through the entire build process, explaining manufacturing processes, terms, and general things which is just invaluable. Now, but enough of my babbling. You can, of course, check out that thread, but of course, what you're watching this video for is to see me open up this masterpiece and break it. So let's get started. Now, because this is a built to manufacture design, I'm going to just assume that getting inside of it is not gonna be difficult at all. Just by looking at how the sheet metal is folded, it looks to be quite a simple undertaking. Just as a side note, you'll see that I'm using this big screwdriver. This is called a number two Phillips head. It has a shaft that's about five millimeters to a quarter of an inch. And this is what I recommend for taking apart an S4 Mini. Most things are built to be taken apart with a number two. If you're using an iFix, it kit, which a lot of my customers use to assemble their S4 Minis. That's a great screwdriver kit for sure, but it does not have the torque that you're going to need, nor is it gonna let you to put the down pressure to get a good mating contact with that screw, which could cause it to strip. All right, with the 10 screws removed, I can take the top cover panel off, and here we have the graphics card on top. And this looks to me to be a 260 from MSI, not a 1060 as I said earlier, but this was designed and built for a 1060. I think James is probably using it and he couldn't afford to loan me his good graphics card. I'm gonna let this all soak in, smell the dust, cherry flavored. We have the STX board and the graphics card and in between is an insulating layer of cardboard. Now we have this foam pad, which I assume prevents some wobbling of the graphics card during shipping or transportation. Oh, it actually prevents the power supply from flopping around and causing damage. Now, before I go too far in, I don't want you to judge the hastily assembled componentry inside this case because James actually just kind of finished up and he's like, Okay, that was fun, I'm moving on. I asked him to throw some parts in so I could take it apart for you guys. James is really a genius. He could have made bracketry and made everything permanent and awesome in here, but that wasn't really his goal. But you are more than welcome to judge me for a sloppy disassembly. Okay, on the side closest to you guys, we see the riser ribbon, and this is from Adex Electronics, which is a company that I actually worked with, so I know that they make really good stuff. So that's what's bridging the PCIe slot and the graphics card. Now, if we rotate the computer, we can see the V-regs and the heatsink kind of 
extruding out and there is a matching cutout, which is very cool. We also see the beginnings of the magic that makes this computer possible. To get a better look, we're gonna take out the graphics card. Now, one of the things I love about this made for manufacturing design is that James actually was able to use really high quality inserts, like for the captured nut that holds down the PCIe bracket for the GPU. I'm going to undo the PCIe ribbon and simply move the graphics card, which was it a 260? It was a 250, so um, I guess I don't get lunch. Okay, so now we see the underside of the mini STX board. STX is a form factor that I would love to take off because it's really tiny. Now we also see the beginnings of the DC-DC converter. This is going to take the DC power that comes from this AC-DC transformer and turn it into voltages that the system can use. Now this is an HD Plex 160 Pico style unit and this is actually a prototype of one of the very first 160s that Larry from HD Plex was developing. The heatsink is not milled. There's some interesting features. Different parts are taped off to prevent electrical short or worse, and I'll just kind of lay this to the side for now. The filtered three-prong jack has a little grounding wire going to the chassis case, and the rest of it goes to a two-pin Molex bridge to the AC-DC unit. And boy, <laughs> you could not have a better fit if you had designed this chassis for this part. Which on the one hand, you could say he did, but this is a standard ATX with power supply, so it really just worked out. I'm actually anxious to see the model for this AC-DC unit. I'm wondering if it's a prototype 300 watt brick or just the 160. No, it is indeed just one of the 160 bricks. Now this is interesting. James is actually supplying power to his STX board via the DC jack that is built in STX and also thin mini ITX. And then the other cable, I'm not quite sure yet. This might go to this riser. It might be a powered riser or he's splitting it off, which is a six pin. I bet this six pin would go to powering his 1060. Okay, let's take a look at this. So here is the HD Plex 160 AC DC power brick. This is basically like a power brick that you'd get with your laptop, but it has an all metal shell and it's designed to actually go inside of your system. So in comes AC from the wall, out comes DC, and he's using a splitter with a specially wired dipole barrel connector. And this goes to the STX board and this other four pin connector, which I'm waiting to see where it goes to. Okie dokie, this is what I am assuming is an SSD. It's been wrapped in gaffer's tape, but it does have a SATA connection. This uses mini SATA power and it goes on to this little header, which says, yep, SATA 1 on the motherboard. But this could be really handy for us modders. You find a motherboard like this with this tiny little connector and you're able to tuck away your SSD in between panels or between parts or something. Now we can get at the STX motherboard. Oh. All right, carefully manipulating this motherboard around so we can get a better look at the wiring that is going on. We have some pigtails for the wireless card going to the back of the chassis or the front of the chassis. I guess that's the front of the chassis. And this goes to a little wireless card which is underneath the Ultra M.2 card. Now this is what's really neato and I hope that this kind of thing inspires you guys for your creations. I'm going to grab my mini screwdriver and take it apart to get a better look. So this mini STX board does not have a typical PCI Express 1X, 2X, 4X, etc. slot, but it does have an Ultra M.2 PCI Express slot. So what James has done is he's sourced an adapter which takes that, turns it into a 4X slot, which he has his riser on, and this is actually a powered riser adapter. So this is what's plugging into his splitter so he can send through 25 watts of power through his riser ribbon. Remember that the specification, well, I'm not actually quite sure. I'm not an expert. Again, read the thread, but 75 watts is what can be delivered through specifically graphics cards through a 16X slot or maybe it's that 16X graphics cards can pull 75 watts through the slot. But typically the max amount of wattage that you can push through a 4X connector would be 25 watts. So if you want to power a graphics card like the 1050 Ti, which doesn't have an external connector, or this R250, 
which doesn't have a connector, you would need to have a powered riser. So don't just expect that you can go buy a 4X, 16X riser off Amazon or eBay or whatever and have it power your non-powered car. It could work, maybe, but as soon as you need to draw what the car was demanding, boom, gonna get a crash. James has sourced this tiny little itty bitty baby connector. And then from there, he's broken out and wired up an LED and a power switch to this front panel connector, which I'll plug right back in there. Underneath, we have an M.2 Wi-Fi module. So I'm gonna pop off the pigtails so we can get a better look at the card. The RAM is 16 gigabytes of DDR4. At least it looks like it's 16 gigabytes, but it's kind of hard to tell from that little tiny sticker. But we're not really done tearing this build yet until we take off the heatsink which is a low profile Silverstone affair. I tried these heat sinks out myself. I bought a bajillion of them for a customer, a large customer, but I found that unfortunately this cooler wasn't super great, number one, although it was low profile and very handy. But the main issue was the fan blade. There was a particular fan blade that would always break off just during normal operation. I know that I purchased the first batch of them. I actually ordered them and receive them as basically the same as retail stores are receiving them, but that kind of was a bummer. Okay, what kind of Tim has James used? NTH1. Now, one of the things that makes this board so cool is that it's a socket board. So you can put your own CPU in and you can put it in a nice CPU. James actually has an i5-6400T in this, which is pretty nice. That's a 35 watt CPU. So altogether, you have a 1060, an i5, and you could put a six gen i7 in this if you wanted to. But this is a really cool board. The modding potential is through the roof. It allows you to get more creative with your layout, with your case design, and really just go nuts in that regard, not be held down by different form factor standards and. I just really dig it. Plus it's square and square is easy to work with. Those rectangles, man, they just really throw you off. James did a really good job with his chassis. It's quite sturdy. I like the minimalism of the folds. He did some interesting things that I wouldn't have thought of, especially for this tab over here above the graphics card expansion slot. Now this chassis and mod would not be complete if you couldn't install it in the back of a computer case like a normal ATX power supply. So James has actually included the threaded inserts so you can do that. Now, I really want one of these quite badly because I think it'd be an absolute blast to bring this to a LAN party when a big full ATX tower, but actually have the side panel off, so it's just a power supply. I just think that'd be really funny. Now, I know that's been done before and it was a pretty funny mod the first time I saw it, but I think James has definitely taken this up a notch and I absolutely love the execution, the style, the power, he did a great job. But the real entertainment is gonna be timing me putting this back together. And I'm not quite sure I can do it. Well, that took about 30 minutes. Something just doesn't feel right. I mean, it was fun taking apart somebody else's masterpiece mod, but I feel like it just doesn't count unless I work on it a little bit. I think I have just the thing. <laughs> <laughs> This is such a bad idea. Who would have thought that you'd be here at the moment to witness this? Because you're about to see something that will astonish you. Truly unbelievable. <laughs> JK, it's fine. But all joking aside, do not forget to check out this forum thread. It is pure gold. I would say it's like a crash course in design for manufacturer, but it's almost a mini university course. Design software, CAD software, how to design it so it can actually be bent on different machines. The types of machines that you use to bend them. Sheet thickness, bin radius, parts allowances, vent cutouts, freaking laser beams, self-clenching nuts, standoffs, etc., etc., etc. This forum thread has it all. 
I guarantee it, it will be the best thing that you read all week. Can't guarantee it, but it is really great stuff. So a big thank you to James for letting me borrow his little mini mod, and I'm sorry for pretend setting it on fire. I mean, I actually did set it on fire, but I pretend. I won't do it again. All right, guys, see you next time. Ha, 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 ha